that time again. It's time for Diary of a Physicist Farm Gal, and this is episode number 35. My name is Deborah, and I'm coming to you here on my family farm in the foothills of the Arkansas Ozarks, where I like to do all the crafts. I crochet, I knit, I sew, I quilt, I make baskets, I make jewelry. I'll try any craft once and twice if I like it. <laughs> I am also a professor of uh, physics and astronomy at a local university where I teach classes to physics majors. I also teach classes for general education people or people trying to get into med school. I teach classes on meteorology, astronomy, astrophysics, physics, physical science, just whatever they need me to cover. And I'm also a volunteer uh, planetarium show uh, giver, I guess is a good way to put that. And I am involved in our Women in Academic Leadership program, and I am a minority faculty mentor this year. Um, and in my free time, I live on my family farm that I own, uh, just like three generations of my family have owned here in the foothills of the Ozarks, where I raise grass-fed beef cattle. I also have horses. I have um, heritage poultry and show-quality rabbits and a rescue herd or retirement herd of miniature donkeys, donkeys, miniature horses, and a miniature mule named Pumpkin who thinks she rules the roost. And as you can tell from my sweet and snuggly little co-host Willie here, I am fur kid mom to 14 dogs, seven indoor cats, and an undetermined number of outside cats. So if any of that sounds interesting to you, I hope you'll come along and join me in episode number 35 of Diary of a Physicist Farm Gal. Okay, if you're looking for me on social media, my farm Facebook page is the same as my YouTube channel name, Buckthorn Farms, um, or you can find me on Instagram and on Ravelry as Doc Firewoman. There is also a Ravelry group for the podcast, Diary of a Physicist Farm Gal, where you can find out about make-alongs or giveaways or just general chit-chat. So you can find me there as well and join in on some of our make-along fun. And I'm also on Twitter, but as I say, every week my mindset is pretty left-leaning liberal. Um, so, and I'm a liberal academic. I'm one of those. Yes, I am. And uh, I try to keep my political points of view to a dull roar everywhere else, but I am going to speak out on issues of social justice everywhere, but I do a lot of my political venting on Twitter. So if that's something that gives you heartburn, probably don't follow me on Twitter, but everywhere else you're probably going to be okay. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, we have several, several make-alongs going in the group right now, and I'll go over what those are. And the rustling you're hearing in the background is one of my cats decided to come in and join me today. Cami Cat is in here. She's also known to my friends on the virtual knitting group as the Grouchy Cat. <laughs> So she's snuffling around in the background on some of the feed sacks, it sounds like. So if you hear a rustling sound, that's what's going on. Um, so the make-alongs that I have going in my group, I have, first of all, a joint make-along with Vanessa from the A Historian Knits podcast called I Like Big Shawls and I Cannot Lie. And it is for shawls that are 1,200 yards specified in the pattern or more and it is a knit along and no you can't have my hot chocolate I see what you're easing over there after <laughs> um, and so any pattern knitted pattern knitted only pattern that is designated for 1200 yards which is a three skein fingering weight shawl or greater there's a bundle there that gives you some ideas about some shawls that you could do that is a year long all the make alongs that I'm going to mention for my group are all a year long uh, the next one is I am co-hosting with Laura from the A Crocheting Hoovian podcast, and it is a year-long creature feature toy make-along. So it's Amigurumi toys, and we are doing quarterly themes. Now, you don't have to follow the theme. You can enter any Amigurumi, but if you follow the quarterly theme, you get a double entry for a prize. So each quarter, so the first one is January, February, March, so you still have got plenty of time to jump in, is Under the Sea. So sea creatures, um, and we've got a variety of sea creatures already posted. Uh, I'm going to be showing you a whip that I have going on that's a sea creature, and I I just bought two patterns today to make two more sea creatures because I'm going to try one of my personal goals this year is to keep an amigurumi oh there's my karachi cat 
Hello, Cammy. <laughs> um, I try to keep an amigurumi going all year long. Cammy, you are not going to help out the situation here, and you can't have this either. Excuse me just a minute while I get things sorted out here. Okay, maybe she'll stay over there. Um, so it is an amigurumi make along next quarter, which will be April, May, June is farm animals. So farm critter critters, uh, or creatures. And then the third quarter will be wild and woolly. So, um, wild animals, animals, not normally considered domesticated animals is how I'm thinking about it. And then the final one is fantastic beasts. So mythical creatures, uh, unicorns, dragons, that sort of thing. So, but you can make any amigurumi you like. Just make something, and it can be knitted or crocheted or loomed, and enter that for prize drawings. We're doing pattern prizes for the quarterly prizes, and then at the end of the year, I'm going to open an FO thread um, on my group where you can post all your amigurumis and, and have a grand prize drawing. Make sure that you check the rules on our two different groups, both with Vanessa's shawl group and then Laura's amigurumi group, because the rules may be slightly different. You can post uh, whips, one whip post per week per project is, is my rule on my group. Uh, my next make along is uh, one called the Kitter Getter Done. Kitter Getter Done is I am a little bit addicted to purchasing kits, as we have seen <laughs> if you've been watching this podcast for any length of time. So um, I am trying to make myself work through some of those. I am trying to shop the craft room instead of buying materials, um, new materials and bringing them in. I'm trying to shop the craft room. As you can see from around me, I have plenty. Oh, here's the cat again. Are you tangled up in the thread? Okay, let's fix that. Cammie. Excuse me, just a minute. okay. Willie has been supplanted by Cammy. Kitter Getter Done, also running all year. Anything that is considered to be a kit, so shawl kits, pre prepared kits, cross stitch, basket tree. I don't care. I don't care what kind of craft it is. Let's just get these kits done and make them into beautiful things instead of hoarding them away like a dragon sitting on its gold, okay? Uh, my next uh, make along is the never have I ever make along and never have I ever is where you learn to do a new skill or a new craft or a new something. So uh, never have I ever can be as simple as something of where you're learning to do a new technique. So for example, um, I learned to do a Russian bind off on a shawl that I will show you in my FOs uh, or you're learning a new craft, like learning to make a basket or learning to make jewelry or learning to knit. Um, you know, I had some people on the group talking about they wanted to learn to knit this year or they wanted to learn to crochet. It seems to be that if people learn one first, they seem to think the other one's going to be a lot harder. And it's just different. It's, it's like apples and oranges to me. I learned to knit way before I learned to crochet, but I learned to crochet because I wanted to learn to make amigurumis. <laughs> I'll be honest. Um, so, yeah. So, never have I ever. Again, that is a year-long uh, make-along. There's The nice thing about it is, is most everybody, and I don't have a huge following in my group, but I do have a very diverse following, and the people that are in there have a lot of skills. So, if you're wanting to learn and have someone to reach out to to ask for help, this is the place to be. Um, so, great. So, let's do that. The last one is probably my favorite of all of them. And it is the Farmer's Almanac make-along. The Farmer's Almanac make-along, because, hey, I am a farm girl, is based upon information and interesting tidbits gleaned from the old Farmer's Almanac. And I cr create a post each month. It's kind of an inspiration post. I try to put it up a couple of weeks ahead of time. So February's post went up on about the 20th of January, and I'll try to do the same thing for March. And I'll create kind of an informational post about some different things going along in February or March or whatever. And you can read about them and you can gain inspiration from them and try to make something. And if you can make the case for me of how this is related to the post, I'm all for it. <laughs> so each month there is a thread. It's a participation only make along. You do not have to finish your item in the month. And... 
then what I do is at the end of each month, I will draw for a pattern prize. And then at the end of the year, again, I'm going to open an FO thread where people can post all the things that they've worked on that have been inspired by the make along. And I will give a big grand prize for that at the end of the year. So all five of those make alongs run all year long. Uh, and those are all mine. You can read about all those on my Ravelry group. I'm also going to be posting a prompt thread because my pot of anniversary is coming up. I started this little podcast a year ago at the end of February. And I didn't have any idea where it would go. But I have made some wonderful friends and, and met some wonderful people. And pushed myself beyond my uh, comfort zone in crafting and also in interacting with people. So it's been a win-win all around. And I hope that I have brought something useful to the community. I hope that you have found something that you have enjoyed out of this. So I'm going to, I don't know what I'm going to give away yet. I'll put together something that I'll post up there and maybe show it on the next podcast. But at, toward the end of the month, there will be a prompt in the Ravelry group. So keep your eye out for it. And I'll probably leave it open for a couple of weeks. And I'll have a physical giveaway prize for that. So I hope that you will continue to watch and will continue to join in in the conversations there and uh, get involved with the prize. Now, I'd like to tell you about some of the make-alongs from, uh, from other groups that I'm aware of. Uh, first of all, uh, Army Wife Knitting Life, which is Jessica, and I believe she's going to rebrand her podcast soon, but she's being kind of cagey about what she's going to do there. So, um, right now it's still Army Wife Knitting Life, and she is having a Golden Girls along. It's called Thank You for Being a Friend, and it, because she loves the TV show The Golden Girls. So... Um, she is uh, hosting that, I believe, through the end of March, and there's going to be a really nice prize from the Golden Pearls, who worked with her on an exclusive colorway um, to give away for that make-along. Um, also, on uh, Knick Knack Knits, which is Nikki, she is also a friend of mine from the Virtual Knitting Group, just like Jessica is, there is a couple of different ones. There's the Scrappy make-along, or the Scrappy Cow Cow, where you can use up scrap, scrap projects like the cowl I have on, which I will talk about in a little bit. Um, or I can talk about it now, but it's my Project Peace Cowl, Project Peace 2018, and I use my Advent Minis to make it. So this, is, this qualifies for the Scrappy Along. Okay, I don't know what the dates are on that exactly. Uh, I forgot to look at them before I started yapping. <laughs> She also has a sock it to me cow where you just have to finish a sock. A sock, not two socks, not a pair, but a sock. So if you've got some um, single socks that you need to make mates to, now's the time to do that. So she's got that up there as well. Pinhook and Needles has a couple going on. There's the Ready, Set, Go um, Make Along, which is, I believe, running through the end of March. The project has to be started after January 1st. And then there is the Tea and Tails uh, make-along, and I believe that one is all year long. So go check those out. I'm sure there are some other ones that I'm forgetting about, but those are the ones I had jotted down. So go check those out, um, and you can be involved in any or all of those. I encourage, strongly encourage double dipping as far as my make-alongs go. Um, so, for example, I know Miss Shirley is making a skunk for February. <laughs> Because skunk breeding season starts in February. And she can also enter her skunk in the creature feature. It won't be a double entry, but it'll be an entry. So that's something. Um, anyway, so those are the make-alongs as I am aware of them at this time. So let's move on. And I'm going to get this grumpy cat out of my lap. Say hello, grouchy cat. Hello, grouchy cat. <laughs> She's purring like crazy. <laughs> She's going to bite me, though, just any second. Uh, and we'll just talk about finished objects. Okay. Now I can get to my cocoa because I made Cammie get down. This is my David's tea mug that my friend Nancy got me. And it's constellations. And the lines fill in when it's got hot drink in it. It's got hot chocolate in it today because... It's chilly outside. Luckily, we're not as cold as some places are. And we'll talk more about polar vortices in science. But it is cold enough to merit a hot drink today. 
Okay, so my finished objects that I want to show for today. Oh, Willie wants back up here. Okay, did that cat take part of your screen time? I'm so sorry. Is that a breach of contract? Are we going to have to renegotiate? Okay, the first thing I finished is my boneyard shawl, y'all. Look, yay! I finished my boneyard shawl. This is a deep triangle shawl. I'm going to put it on over this cowl. And it's going to look really bulky. But um, this is a deep <laughs> triangular shawl pattern that is a free pattern by Stephen West. So West Knits. And it is in the colorway Party on Prince Street by Leon Alexander Yarns. This is a DK weight shawl. And this was my take to class or take to lab knit before class, knit during lab, knit during exam time uh, project. So I powered through it and got it finished. And I learned to do a new bind off on it. I learned to do a Russian bind off. So that would qualify for never have I ever. Um, I, but I learned to do a Russian bind off on it. It had suggested a sewed bind off. And I was going to do that, but I was sitting on the couch, and frankly, I had a dog in my lap, and I didn't want to get up to go get a, a tapestry needle. So I decided I would try something else. So I got on New Stitch a Day and learned the Russian bind off, and that's what I used on this shawl. This is a beautiful three, I used almost every bit of three skeins of DK weight yarn on this. Um, but you can tailor it to whatever size you want, and you could probably change the weight fairly easily and just knit till it's the size that you want it. So this is the Boneyard Shawl, again, by Stephen West and Leon Alexander Yarns. It's a beautiful, oh, that's the backside. It's a beautiful um, garter or stockinette with the Garter Ridge detail shawl, and in their colorway party on Prince Street which is an exclusive colorway to the Twisted Pearl in Cottonway, Arkansas. Although I heard that they're closing their store, so I don't know what's going on with that. But anyway, so yeah, so that's my first uh, finished object. Yay, I'm excited about that, which gave me a huge case of cast on -itis getting finished with that, which you will see in whips <laughs> or a future crafting, actually. Then I had already shown uh, this shawl as a finished object. This is The Happiness Blooms from Within by C.J. Brady. It is a free crochet pattern. But what I did was I made myself some beaded tassels for it. I wanted it, it calls for tassels, and I like making these beaded ones because I got this idea from Two Hearts Crochet on the Kraken shawl that I made last year. And I thought that would be a nice detail for this shawl. So it's got three tassels on it now. And it adds, it just elevates it just a little to have the beading on it. It would be beautiful without, but the other thing is, is I put them on, um, I put them on clasps so I can take them off if I don't want them and leave them on if I do. So that makes it versatile, right? Okay, so that is uh, Happiness Blooms from Within. I also call this my Neapolitan Nougat Shawl because it reminds me of those Brock candies. These were all gifted yarns from get my yarn wish granted from uh miss mary uh these are all rustic-y yarns um that she was kind enough to to gift me uh for my knitting pleasure and it is incredibly warm i wore it yesterday when it was really cold and it kept me very very warm and i'm thankful for that okay um now those are my yarny fo's i did get my little friend my little neighbor friend's hat finished. I got the, I washed it and got the ends woven in. I've already showed this once, but I'm going to take this, call her mom, and get this to her this afternoon. Then, uh, I have some, some uh, sewing FOs. The first thing that I will show are these two little guys. <laughs> these are, they were called, uh, let's see, what were they called? Critter Crafts. And they have little books with them. And they were, basically all you had to do was stuff them and sew them up. Okay, sew them together and stuff them. They were already uh, cut out and the, sh the main shapes were already made. But they all come with a little book. So this is Reynard's Secret secret Fox Hall. Okay, Reynard the Fox. And then this one is um, Flora's Flowers. So they come with their little books. And uh, you just stuff them and sew them together and then they're done. And I've got three more of these. I've got a beaver, a moose, and a zebra that I still need to, to stuff. 
Lord, I can't tell you how long I've had these. I bought these, I think, at Joanne Crafts on clearance sale. And it was before I moved home. And I've been home 15... How long have I been home? 14 years. Be 14 years this fall. So, a little while. No time like the present. Right? Yay. More fuzzy friends. All right. So, then I... Have got it stuffed, but I have the trim sewn on to the little bench pillow. This little bench pillow was a panel, and I don't know if it was one of my panels or one of my mom's, but uh, you could make a draft stopper for a door, and I'm not sitting anything like this on the floor for a couple of reasons. I have male dogs is the first reason. Use your imagination. I have 14 dogs, so it would just collect hair like nobody's business. And I have seven cats, and they would try to use it as a scratching post. So this is a, this is going to be a bench pillow. Okay, so I, t I pleated the bottom of it so that it would stand up once that it's stuffed. And I put the trim on it. And I'm going to embellish the little critters. I don't know. I'm going to probably sew some bells on it and do some other things to embellish it. But I've got to get a new box of stuffing. I've got a five-pound box, but I think I've used about half of it. So, um... The next time it goes on sale at the big box store, I'm going to go pick up a new box of stuffing. Or I could use my coupon on it any time, I guess. But I've got to go up there and get... I've got a gift certificate, a gift card that I've got to go get some yarn to finish up my Sea Life blanket. So I might get some stuffing when I go for that. Okay. Uh, then I also finished the little baby bibs. I do still need to put a Velcro closure or a snap on this one. But I sewed the trim just around the little baby bibs. Whoops, where are you going, buddy? Okay, so I got two of those done. This is just a bias binding that I sewed around the edges and uh, finished it off. And we'll have those. I've got about four more of these that I could finish up. Um, I want to put these in the fair. The, the sewing on these is not perfect enough to put them in the fair, though. I made some mistakes, so hopefully I'll get better on the next round. But I'll put these in my gift pile to give away the next time I have someone in my orbit who is having a baby or a grandbaby. Then I finished Miss Betsy's apron. Okay, mine is almost done. It is a whip. I'm not going to show it since you'll have seen this one. But uh, I finished Miss Betsy's Gingerbread Man apron, okay? Um, they, these panels call for you to just fold under a hem on these and sew them down, but I don't think that looks very nice. So I actually line all of these. This is a sports weight, a sportswear lining. It's like a lightweight red denim. And I, so I lined my straps and I lined the apron with that. And it gives the apron a nice weight so it hangs nicely. Um, and it just makes it look more finished in my opinion. So gingerbread cookies. This was a little printed panel from Marcus Brothers textiles. I don't think you can get it anymore. Uh, again, because these are, these panels that I'm showing you, most of them, I haven't bought many recently. Most of these are at least 10, more like 15 years old. So these are vintage <laughs> without really meaning to be. They just kind of worked out that way. I did see a panel of this for a tree skirt on eBay, but they wanted way too much for it. So I suspect you could probably search on eBay and find these panels every once in a while coming up. I find vintage panels from time to time on there uh, as well. So you could probably find them and, um, yeah, if you want, if you really wanted one, but I've got enough printed panels to last from now till the sun goes red giant in five billion years. <laughs> so I don't need to buy any more, <laughs> which probably doesn't mean I won't, because I'll find some that I like. But you know, I'm, I'm well stocked in that area. Anyway, so that's all of my whips, and so now we're, or excuse me, fo. So now we're going to move on to whips, and this is going to take a while because I've got quite a few. Okay, so um, I've got a few whips to show this week in various stages of uh, work. Uh, since I haven't podcast in a couple of weeks, I actually have made some very discernible progress on most everything that I had working on. Okay, so the first thing that I will show is I had this little pumpkin kit. I've showed him a few times 
as a possible future crafting. And so I finally dug him out and got started. Uh, I cut out all the pieces. It's a double layer uh, kit. And then I went ahead and started work on his little face. So I've got the blanket stitching done on his little face. I need to paint that button as a wooden nose that you glue on last. So I've got to do that at the end. And the way this is called to be made, and I don't think I like it, is you put the two pieces of felt together, and then you put two more pieces, and you sew this seam so that there's a raw edge inside. At least that's the way I'm reading the directions. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to sew an outside together, one piece with one piece. I'm going to sew the whole outside together, and I'm going to sew a corresponding lining of the other pieces and put them together so that there's no raw edges on the inside. And then um, you have a little um, handle that you wrap in the green felt, and then you do these leaves last and put those on at the very end. So, uh, yeah, so I got a, a fair bit done on him. That stitching took some time. Um, you know, it calls for you to glue it down, and I just took little bits of, um, I have the heat and bond tape, and I just... Uh, because all you're doing is just holding it in place instead of using pins. So I just took some little tiny pieces of heat and bond and fused it to that so that I could hold that in place while I did my stitching. So that's my first uh, work in progress. I'm, I'm happy I finally got that started. Again, that is a kit by Rivertown Warehouse. Doubt that they still exist because again, this was May this was cop oh this was copyright 2005 so this is 14 years <laughs> 14 years old ah. <laughs> oh if you're wondering why I have so many things that haven't been touched in so long I essentially put my crafting and sewing and any creativeness and to a large degree my horses on hold um, while I, my folks were sort of I was dealing with their end of life. Um, issues. So that took some time. And um, so my crafting stuff laid packed up in storage for the first probably about 10 years or 11 years I was home. So I'm making up for lost time now. Uh, now that my folks passed away um, seven, five years ago, six years ago now. Um, it'll be seven years ago for my dad in this summer, the coming summer. Um, so I, you know, things have lain, lain dormant for a while and that's why. Uh, the next thing is I have gotten to the point where I've cut out backing and batting for the little fall panels. They're inside out right now because I need to stitch around them and turn them right side out. But I went ahead and cut out backing and batting for both the wall quilt and the little banner, the little autumn banner. Okay. So um, I'm going to try to get those sewed up and turned, and then I'm going to quilt those probably on the machine uh, and do some embellishing on those um, after I get them turned and quilted. Uh, so those will be two more uh, long-term finished object projects. And then the last sewing, well, no, not the last. Well, I'll show you these first. These are the other little stuffies that I have. This is the little moose. i got to stuff him. This is what they look like before they're stuffed up. This is Ross T. Moose. And then um, this is the little zebra. And this is, what's her name? Um, Sam. Oh, it's a boy. Sam. I guess Sam could be a girl. Sam. Samantha, right? Yeah, could be a girl, too. And then the little beaver. <laughs> He's probably my favorite. Uh, and this is Aunt Millicent the Sculptress. She's a wood sculptor. So, anyway. Then I started putting together this little vest. This, again, is a printed panel. Where the front parts, the front part and the back part are printed on the panel. And then you have to provide the lining fabric. So I have used that blue star lining fabric because I thought it coordinated well. And then after you sew it together, then you're kind of you can kind of let your imagination run wild in terms of embellishment. I'll probably do some embellishing on these as well because there is a decorative um, clothing co um, entry point for the fair, and I would put it in that. So those are my sewing whips. Now let's move on to my fiber whips. 
Okay, so for my fiber whips, <laughs> I don't know why I've ended up carrying this thing around in a shoe box. It just seems it fits the skein of yarn. <laughs> I think that's why. This is my second uh, under the sea sea creature amigurumi. This is um, Octavia the octopus. This is a free pattern from the yarn Spirations, which I believe is is uh, sugar and well, this is made out of sugar and cream. And I forget what company owns Yarn Inspirations. I want to say Burnett, maybe. But anyway, Octavia the Octopus. And I am, I showed you just a little bit last time. I have put on four tentacles, which really, I learned that octopi do not have tentacles. They have two arms and six legs. So I don't know if these are arms or legs, but I'm going to make eight of them. <laughs> <laughs> the pattern calls for seven, but I'm going to try to squeeze in eight if I can because it, I've got to be correct. You know, I've got to, you know, <laughs> I'm that scientist person. But anyway, so um, very simple, straightforward pattern. Then I have to put a base on it and there'll be a contrast bottom to these tentacles, eyes, and then she'll be done. Okay. So that is Octavia the octopus. And I'm just uh, doing that out of Red Heart you know, just inexpensive red heart acrylic yarn in the color blaze, or flame, excuse me. I said it was blaze last night. Somebody was flame. It's the same orange as my hunting vest. This is blowing out really bad, but it's very bright orange. Uh, so that is another uh, pattern for the Amigurumi make-along that I'm hosting. Obviously, I can't enter my own make-along, but I'm using it as a way to spur me on to make new things. And I just bought a pattern for a whale shark and a hammerhead shark that I'm going to make. And I, had, and I was kindly gifted a pattern from the ladies at Pinhook and Needles for their sea turtle. So I'm going to try to make three more Amigurumis of the Under the Sea theme before the quarter is up. Okay. Uh, the next thing that I will show is my new take it to class and work on it because it's easy to memorize the pattern. This is in my little little science friends um, bag that was made for me as a gift by Mary. And this is the simple chevron stripe so scarf. Okay, and it's by Karen Martinez. Okay, I have to look every time. I can never remember her first name. This is designed to work for self-striping sock yarn. So if you have a self-striping sock yarn that you don't want to use for socks, this would be an excellent alternative to um, that pattern. I am knitting this out of String Theory Color Works in a colorway called Hawking Radiation. Uh, String Theory Color Works, if you, I've talked about her quite a bit. Uh, she is a scientist and she names her colorways mostly after science things and this one is named in honor of Stephen Hawking's discovery of Hawking radiation and I purchased this last year on the day that he left this mortal coil and this is my farmer's almanac eligible uh, knit because his birthday was in January so the last time I showed it to you it was down here by this little progress keeper that my friend Carol made me that's a horseshoe and I have knitted all of this. So I've done a lot of meeting knitting and um, knitting uh, before class. This is my new work on it because I can memorize the pattern. It's a two-stitch two repeat pattern. Very simple to memorize. I'm not, I'm not halfway yet, but I'm almost halfway on it. So, uh, but anyway, so it's a beautiful 10-row repeat of pink and blue or pink and black yarn. So that's Hawking Radiation by String Theory Color Works, and that's the Simple Chevron Stripe Scarf by uh, Karen Martinez. It's a free pattern on Ravelry that you can go and get. And so hopefully I will be finishing that up sooner rather than later. And for some reason, I just decided on a whim that I wanted to knit this on straight needles. I happen to have, you know, people... People give me their craft supplies that they get and they decide to have a clear out. And they're like, Marie Kondo, I ain't, y'all. Because you know what? Everything in this house brings me joy. Except with the possibility of the bills. But you can't throw those out. So, I'm not getting rid of squat. So, bring me your, your craft supplies that you don't find joy anymore. I'll be really joyful to have. Woo! <laughs> anyway, so um, 
Yes, I'm turning into my grandmother, and if you told me 20 years ago I was going to do that, I'd scream in your face. But she grew up during the Depression, and so she saved everything. Bread bags, bread ties, the plastic trays that meat used to come on. I mean, everything. Because you didn't throw anything away because you might need it. I'm not quite that bad, but, um, well, I have my own things that I'm that way about. <laughs> so... Oh, Lordy, Cammie's over there in that big, giant pile of fabric. Let's hope it don't come tumbling down. Anyway, so, yeah, Simple Chevron Stripe Scarf by uh, Karen Martinez in Strength Three Color Works uh, Hawking Radiation. So, yeah, so there's that. That's my first whip. Okay. Or my second yarny whip. Let's see, the next one I'll show, I'm going to show that one last, because that's the one I've got the most done on. My next one that I will show is in my little turkey uh, bag by a Magpie Knits. My friend Agatha has a cute selection of bags in her shop, and she also dyes yarn, and she's extremely reasonable. And she will work with you on custom colorways. She has an Etsy shop, so go check her out. Again, I was in this mood to do straight needles. I'm done with them for now, though. This is the Atomic Powered Hat by Argent Gal Designs, Teresa Silver. So the Atomic Powered Hat here. And you can see it's got the old Atomic symbol on it. She kindly gifted me this pattern. And I am knitting it out of Chicken Coop Dye Works on her Hen DK base. And this is delicious feeling yarn, y'all. I wish you could feel how soft this is. This is Hen, and it's in the colorway Dungarees. And she has her own website, Chicken. I think it's called Coop Dye now, D-Y-E. So you can go there and look at her beautiful, beautiful, beautiful yarn and um, buy some stuff. <laughs> this one I am just finished with the brim, and the way this is knit is you knit the brim back and forth this way to get your one by one rib is just garter stitch and then it has part of the atomic symbol dips down in it's not the brim the ribbing not the brim is that the brim kind of yeah that's the brim anyway uh the the atomic symbol dips down into that and so you have to put stitches you do a little bit of cabling and put some stitches on hold and then now i'm ready to seam this up and i'll put this on circular needles and pick these stitches up and start up the rest of the hat so it feels like it's going to be a nice fit it's not going to be super tight and it's not going to be loose so i think i did okay i actually went down a needle size or two needle sizes for this and then i'll go down i think a needle size on the top part but anyway so yeah so those stitch markers are actually holding the stitches that i've got put on hold uh, until i'm ready to pick those up so that is the Atomic Powered Hat by Teresa Silver, knit in Chicken Coop Dye Works um, dungarees on their hen base. And then Agatha's shop, go check that out. She's got some cute stuff. She was having a sale, but I think that it's over right now. So, But she still has cute stuff, and she will work with you on custom colorways for dyeing if you're interested, if you'll just contact her. Okay. Um, let's see. Willie, honey. We're going to change gears just a minute and show you the cross stitch that I'm working on. Uh, I made a little bit of progress on my little cross stitched ornament. Um, not a lot, but a little bit. So this is a holiday time uh, Gamekeeper Santa cross stitch ornament. This is a Janlin um, kit that was sold, I believe, only at Walmart a long time ago. <laughs> And I haven't worked a lot on this, but I've made some progress on it since y'all saw it last. So, um, I try to work on cross stitch like one night a week or two nights a week, just when the mood strikes me. So, the closer I get to being done on something, though, the more eager I am to work on it. So, I'm kind of feeling the itch to work on this and try to get it. Cross stitch to me looks like a bunch of blobs, and then you finally start it all start to come together. So, this is getting to the point now where it's all starting to kind of make sense and come together. So maybe I'll be more eager to work on that tonight. Okay. Then, let's see. The next thing I'll show is also in one of Agatha's bags. This is A Magpie Knits again. This is one of her Halloween bags that she had in her shop. And this is 
the Gothic Angel Shawl by Boo Knits. It was a mystery knit along last fall, but it is over now. It's the, the mystery is done. And let's see if I can find the front of this. It is a lacy shawl done on lace weight yarn. There it is. So Gothic Angel, it was a mystery knit along last, her Halloween mystery knit along from last year. It is a lacy shawl and that's kind of the general shape of it in lace weight yarn with, with lots of beading. And I actually got a ways on this. I am learning to read my knitting better, which makes me feel better. I am knitting this in Kim Marie Knit Knacks, um, West Texas Sunset. This is her lace weight, Trinity lace weight base. And um, I think it's 800, 822 yards to 150 grams. I bought this in my local knitting shop, knit two together. And I love Kim Marie's colorways. I've used quite a bit of her yarn, and her yarn is always beautiful and good quality, co good colors and good quality yarn. Uh, so I actually have gotten quite a bit done on this in, since you saw it last, because I haven't showed it in a while. Um, the last time you saw it, it was down there <laughs> where the little dog bone was. And I've got this on, let me, let me take this off real quick. Ugh. I've got this on my circular needles, but you can see how much I've added to it. So the little dog bone is down here very at the very bottom. I had basically just gotten through the very, very beginnings of this shawl when I had started it back. And now I'm this far, and I have learned the values of two things. Lifelines and every lace repeat has a stitch marker. So that way it's easy to keep track. So, this is a beautiful lacy shawl. Uh, it's hard to tell what's going on in this lighting. Let me put these back on because I sure don't want to drop any stitches. Whew, that's, I live in fear of that on these lacy shawls like this. Okay. So, it, you can kind of see as I'm opening it up there, you can see the pattern repeating. So, yeah, I'm not through... I think I'm almost through clue one, what was clue one, and then I'll start clue two. Uh, this is a project that I have to work on when I'm not around people. I have to have, you know, serious concentration uh, going on to uh, get this done because I don't want to make mistakes. I have just started chart three out of, let's see. Yeah, chart three out of seven, and then there's a Pico bind off. So, and you know, I, I guess I'm one of those people that people say, oh, I hate doing this. I hate weaving in ends. I hate Pico bind off. I hate I cord bind off. I hate this. I hate that. I'm a process knitter, I have concluded. I like to learn stuff. And if it's going to elevate the object to the next level by doing it, I'm going to do it. Yeah, it may take me longer, but... I'm not in a race with you. I'm not going to race you to try to get done with stuff. I am doing this for me, and I want it to look cool. So, like the other day, I came in, and I didn't really intend to do this, but I came in, and I thought I needed to... Oh, I was making those tassels for that um, shawl, for the happiness blooms from within. I thought, I'm going to make those tassels. I was driving home, and I just said to myself, okay, when you get home, you're going to make those tassels. And so I sat down and I made those. And then this was sitting there. And because this was a scrappy project, it had quite a few ends that needed to be woven in. So I just went, okay. And I sat there and I was listening to a podcast on, I think I was listening to Stuff You Missed in History Class. And I sat there and I wove in all my ends. Oh, Cammie's back. <laughs> and then I wove in the ends on my boneyard. And then I wove in on the ends on Alyssa's hat. And I thought, okay. So, you know... If it elevates the object to the next level, I'm going to do it because that's the kind of person I am. I'm not concerned about how long it takes me to make something, obviously. <laughs> um, so, yeah. So, I don't mind weaving in ends. If, I mean, if you mind it, I, I totally get that you would rather be working on other stuff. But I don't mind doing it. It's kind of, um, you know, you put on a good podcast or you put on a TV show that you like to watch and you just weave in ends. I mean, it's no big deal. 
So, um, yeah. So, the last thing that I'm going to show is the one that I've probably put the most of my work in on this, this time. This is in my April 9 Designs Alpacas bag. Okay, April 9 Designs. She makes beautiful bags also. And she has an Etsy shop. Uh, this is the Larissa Brown Midwinter Moon. This was also a mystery knit along. Okay, mystery knit along. Didn't get it done by the deadline, but that's okay. And I am knitting this out of Potion Yarns. There are three colorways in this uh, shawl. My, my lightest color or my C color is Magic Mermaid. My middle color, if I can reach it, is Dread Pirate Roberts. And then my dark color is, which I don't have that much of it left, it's the one I've used the most of, is Ancient Ritual. So these are the three colors together here for that shawl. And I absolutely love Potion Yarns yarn. This stuff, oh my goodness, it's just, mm, it feels so good. So um, anyway, she, her, Johanna, she has a, a podcast called The Color Cauldron, and she's located in Kansas City. She has a website shop. Go check her out. I love her yarn, and she's very sweet, too. I met her at East Texas Fiber Festival, and I really enjoyed it getting to meet her. So the last time you saw, guys saw this, I was this far on it. So I was down here where the a little alpaca was that came with my bag from Charlotte. And I have knitted all of this since the last time you saw it. Okay. Oh, I'm getting close to the end of that needle. Let's not pull that off. <laughs> anyway, this is the full, the full clue one and two is done. And I'm getting ready to, um, I think the next part, you go back this way and pick up stitches to make the shape work over this way. So that's where I'm at right now. So I kind of wanted to put it on hold until I was able to show it to you guys before I got to that part. Because I have to put some of this off on um, waste yarn. And actually probably what I will do, because I'm lazy... I will get a pair of knitting needles that are the same size, another circular pair of needles, and I will put it off on that and put end caps on the needles to keep my stitches from coming off. So that instead of having to pick up off of waste yarn, I can pick up off of a needle because that's easier to me. <laughs> anyway, so you can see how beautifully, let me pull this back out. You can see how beautifully these colors have all worked together in this shawl, Cami. I just absolutely love how these are going together. I could not have asked for more fabulous color choices for this shawl. So I'm really pleased. This light green right here, it, it really glows. I mean, it glows almost like it's fluorescent. It's just amazing. Uh, so that is the Midwinter Moon Mystery Knit Along Shawl, or now it's just the Midwinter Moon Shawl by Larissa Brown. Um, and she is the one who did the uh, moon phase shawl that I did last year. So I knew I would like her shawls. Um, so check her out. So yeah, so that is all of my whips for this week. So phew, that was a lot. <laughs> so now we're going to move on and talk about future crafting. Okay, so I've <laughs> you finish a shawl, like the boneyard, and you think, Ah, I need some more stuff to work on. And I've been doing this Celtic, Celtic Year Club, uh, Shawl Club by a Wooly Wonka Fiber Company. And I'm up to my third shawl kit, which I'll show you in, in acquisitions. But I hadn't started any of them yet, so I'm like, ah, I need to start that. So I decided to go ahead and wind yarn for the first shawl, which was the Samhain shawl. And it is called the Calaveras Shawl. Okay, and it's exclusive to the yarn, or it's exclusive to the shawl club until next year, I believe. It was designed by Lori Law, and it is a beautiful beaded shawl. You can see it there. It's a beautiful beaded shawl. Uh, the beading goes up the spine of the shawl, so here. And in the, the kit from the shawl club, you get the colorway, which is designed, or which is dyed by Wooly Wonka. This is their Nimue sock base, and this is in the colorway Spiced Apple, which is a gorgeous candy apple red. 
you get the pattern, you get a few little extras. Well, hello, Cammy. And in this case, we got the beads that we needed, which are gold lined red beads and some stitch markers. So I've got this wound up and ready to go in my Cammy. In my home row fiber co bag that was a gift from Vanessa. So I love this bag too. She got me a pen that matched that logo on it. So uh, so I wound that up and have that ready to go. Cammy. Grouchy cat. Don't <laughs> you are such a grouch. <laughs> See what I mean? She's a grouchy cat. Jump down. Okay. Oh, I knocked my cow down. Okay. So, the next thing that I wound up is in my By the Bay Yarn Co. Um, canvas bag. By the Bay Yarn Co. is um, located in Texas. And she has wonderful, very reasonably priced canvas bags. And this is one of her bigger ones. And it's got pockets inside of it, which I love. I love pockets. So I decided the next thing I wanted to make was the Malibu shawl by Jody Brown. And this is a DK weight shawl, garter stitch, DK weight. If you know Jody Brown from the Grocery Girls, you know that she's a woman after my own heart because she believes that knitting is better than purling. <laughs> and I am right there with her. So she designed this beautiful garter shawl with fringe. And I have, oops, I have the colors wound up for it as well. Um, this colorway is by Shipwreck Sheep. It's called Won't Be Erased, and it donates to the Trevor Project. It is a colorway in honor of all of our transgendered persons who are friends of ours who that we care about and love and we will not allow their them to be erased so um these are the colors of the transgender pride flag and she created this and is donating profits from this to the trevor project so shipwreck sheep i believe she's still selling that colorway then this is a colorway from Carolyn of Chicken Coop Dye Works. You saw her hen base earlier. I believe this is also um, hen, if I remember right. Yes, this is her hen DK base. And this is a gorgeous colorway called Texas Tea. So I thought those two worked pretty well together. And then to harmonize them, I just bought some commercial uh, DK weight yarn. Uh, this is a company called... Um, creative, but it's with a Crea, like an I, like a alpaca, DK, and this is alpaca, an alpaca cotton blend, I think, and modal, so nylon. Okay, so these are my three colors that I'm going to use for the shawl. Oops, doesn't look very good with all those stringy bits. Why are all those stringy bits hanging off there anyway? So those are my three colors that I'm going to use for the Malibu shawl. I'm thinking that I'm going to make this one the one that I make the fringe out of. So this would be like my color one, and then this would be my color two, and then this would be my color three. I may not like that once I start, but I think that's what I'm going to do. So I've got that all wound up and ready to go. And since that's a nice, simple uh, garter stitch shawl, um, it's kind of a wedge, weird kind of wedge shape. I like how it looks. Um, you can kind of see the, the shape. I don't think I'm giving away too much by showing that. Um, and so I'm excited to make this and get this done. This is going to be my take into class, knitting before class, knitting during lab, knitting because it will be easy to memorize the pattern. Okay. The last thing that I am deciding that needs to get started, I've kind of already started a little bit, but it's not really enough to call it a whip. This is in my bag that was given to me by Yolanda from the Happy Knits podcast. I won this in her 12 Days of Christmas make-along. And I decided I better get this sucker started because it's a big shawl and I cannot lie, it is the Fading Point. The Fading Point by Holy Locatelli. Okay, it's a big rectangular, basically schlank it, <laughs> I guess. 
And I am knitting this out of very, very bright uh, colors from Leon Alexander Yarns. And so I have wound the first two, and I've got the first one in here, and I'm going to knit this in tandem. So I just started, so I've knit two balls, or uh, char wound two balls of this colorway, and I've just barely gotten started. But I've got two sets of needles, and I'm going to knit this in tandem. So I'm going to knit... I've got this up to where I'm starting the lace chart. So now I'm going to go to my other ball and start the second part of that and knit it up to where I'm ready to start the lace chart. And I'm just going to knit back and forth like that on it um, as I go. Because that way I make sure that I don't run out of yarn on one side. I make sure that I don't have half a shawl when I'm done. When I'm done, I'm done. And... Also, my tension won't be dramatically different, I hope, on the two halves. Uh, you know, people say, oh, it takes so long to do two at a time, this, or whatever. It takes the same amount of time. It takes the same... Oops. Cammie, you are aggravating. Cammie, you're causing a disaster. <laughs> and she is utterly unapologetic about it, too. Doesn't take me twice. I mean, I don't know. I've never knit a sock at a time because I know that if I do, that's all I'll have is a sock. I'll have a sock, and that will be the end of that. And this is why I don't let the cats in the room. <laughs> anyway, so right that, that's going to be it for, I believe, for my future crafting for this week. So let's move on and talk about some science before Cammie knocks the camera down again. We're not talking about science. We're talking about acquisitions. And Cammie's cranky. Cammie had me kerfuffled and I forgot. We're talking about acquisitions next. So if you're just here for the craftiness, I'll see y'all soon. But if y'all want to see, I just got a couple of little acquisitions. And then we're going to talk about some science. If y'all stick around till then, we'll go. Right, Cammie? <laughs> okay, acquisitions. Acquisitions. I just have a couple. Um... Nikki was my swap partner. Nikki from the Knick Knack Knits podcast was my swap partner for a swap in a virtual knitting group that I'm part of. And I got my gift from her. And it is so, so perfect. She went out of her way to find this periodic table fabric. Are those not awesome? Went out of her way to find this fabric for me because she knows I love the periodic table. I could not be more tickled with those bags. Then she crocheted me, and I had been looking at this little ornament pattern myself. She crocheted me some little snow globe ornaments, and look, they've got farm animals. There's donkeys and chickens and cows and pigs and sheep and horses on there. So she crocheted those for me with little snowflakes. And then last but not least, she made me these adorable uh, pro stitch markers. Look at those. Aren't those beautiful? So that was my gift from Nikki. Thank you so much. I even love, look, she used measuring tape for the drawstrings. Isn't that cool? I love those bags. So I was tickled as I could be to get those. The only other acquisition I'm going to share this week is uh, I got my third installment of the uh, Celtic Year um, Shawl Club. And this holiday is in bulk. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that after a while. But in bulk is sometimes called St. Bridget's Day. Bridget was a Celtic goddess that got co-opted as a saint to kind of bring the, the Celts into wanting to participate in church functions. She's the patron saint of Ireland. I write a lot about this in my... Oh, that's a nice marshmallow there. I write a lot about this in my entry for the Farmer's Almanac, uh, Make Along for um, February. But in bulk to the farmers... And the agrarian people was a time when you could noticeably tell that the days were getting longer. And it's sort of the first early spring, starting to see a little bit of weedy green poke up. The, chick, the chickweed and the hen bit here are starting to stick their heads up a little bit, as are the daffodils. So it's like, okay, we've almost made it through winter. We've almost made it. Just hang on a little bit longer and spring will be here. And so that... And it's also a fire festival. Her hearth fires were relit during this time. Um, candles were blessed uh, for the homes. And then also you could make Bridget's crosses, which are three or four armed crosses, a lot of times made out of um, wheat. 
because Bridget was the hearth goddess of the hearth and home, and she protected the home. But she was also, you know, you didn't mess with her either. She was a blacksmithing goddess and um, a fire goddess too. So she was kind of the all-around agrarian person. She, I have a lot of affinity for her because she is an all-around um goddess in that way she's not just one or the other she has many many facets so this month's uh club first of all the little extras we got we got some wildflower seed bombs so in the green there and these are seed bombs that i have um sweet alyssum shirley poppy catch fly and snapdragon and then there's mexican torch hat and white yarrow and i have white yarrow already growing in my yard and i'll put these in my garden along with all those wildflower seeds i got at the forestry days and then we got some beautiful little stitch markers for our shawls we got the shawl pattern it's called bridget and it's by jen lucas this month and then the shawl pattern takes two skeins of the nimaway sock woolly wonka uh, that woolly wonka does and this is in the colorway called willow so it's that very pale spring green early spring green that you see so got those which is what prompted me to finally wind the yarn for the october <laughs> kit our next one will be um ostara which is in march the spring equinox the vernal equinox so in about six weeks uh, because in bulk is technically february 1st so that would be tomorrow as um as i'm recording this so those are my two acquisitions and now we're going to talk about science Okay, so science, and far as far as being the professor is, you know, we're clicking along on the semester. It's off to a good start. I, I think I have really good groups. Uh, we've scheduled our visit to uh, the meteorology program at the University of Oklahoma. Um, my friend that works out there was on furlough due to the government shutdown, but I think he's back at work now. Um, so hopefully we will en enjoy that trip. It's going to be the end of February. Um, which could be some interesting weather, you know, just depends on, on what's going on. Got that trip scheduled. Um, I went to a workshop. I've been to some teaching workshops this year so far, or this semester so far, and then our Women in Academic Leadership uh, program meets for the first time tomorrow, so I'm looking forward to that. Um, I've written a lot of letters of recommendation for a couple of my students. One of them is applying to a graduate program, and the other one is applying to summer research programs. And it's always a pleasure to write letters for good students. I had a, a case where I had to write a letter for a student who... I've only had him for one semester, and so I can't really speak to his academic ability all that much. Plus... I just didn't feel like I could give him a glowing letter. I could just say, you know, he's a capable student. And that's, I hate writing letters like that because I kind of feel like it's, as the phrase goes, damning by faint praise because I don't know him well enough. But he had asked me and, I, and he said, well, I don't really know anybody else to write a letter. And I'm like, okay, I mean, I can be, you know, I'll be honest about your academic performance and all that stuff. But, it, you know, it's just hard when you get approached like that. I have said no to a couple of students. It's very rare because they usually know better than to ask if they knew I would say no, but I have had to say no a couple of times to students, which is not fun, but at least they don't want a bad recommendation, so they don't want me writing it. Um, I haven't done any planetarium shows yet this semester. Uh, most of my school groups have canceled so far, but I think some are coming up. Uh, we have scheduled our Super Science Saturday for the Kids and Community Connections. We've got that ready to go. Um, so that's just kind of where we are clicking along. Um, I'm excited about the trip in the meteorology class and I'm excited about the things that I'm learning from, uh, the workshops that I've been to. So it's always good to be challenged to break out of your mold, I think. Um, so what I thought I would do is talk a little bit about, I know that there are a lot of people that I know and a lot of people and maybe even some of you who are enduring this unbearable, dangerous cold right now, the polar vortex. And we've actually been talking about that in my meteorology class what, from the global circulation cells. And I get very frustrated when people quickly quip 
where's global warming at? Because I don't understand the processes that drive weather. The reason this polar vortex is so strong is because there is a big temperature gradient between the poles and the equatorial oceans. And that gets enhanced when the oceans are heated. So there's your global warming. Your global warming is in the polar vortex. It's not, that's why we don't really like to call it global warming, we'll call it climate change. Because if that gradient is enhanced because the oceans are what's getting hotter, then you're going to strengthen that difference and you're going to have these jet streams that do these weird things like the polar vortex. So whatever you may believe about that, at least use the word correctly. <laughs> Right, at least use the scientific term correctly. Um, it's, it's got to do with the temperature difference that causes the jet stream to bow way down into the, into the uh, continental U.S. That's what's happening right now. What's happening is there is a very strong low pressure system that is drawing cold air in off the polar regions. And the jet stream is dipping down over... The continental United States. So I have a couple of pictures I'll show you. So let me turn the camera. Okay, there is always a low pressure system over the poles. Okay, it's called the polar low and it's always there. And we always have jet streams that exist because of the convergence of the global wind cells. So this is a convergence zone right now. Okay, so when that gradient is not very strong, you have what's called a stable polar vortex that keeps the cold air concentrated in the polar regions. But if you get a big gradient, you get what's called a wavy polar vortex. So the stronger that allows the cold air to push down because what's trying to happen is the temperature is trying to come into equilibrium. So the cold air pushes down, the warm air pushes north and you get this wave. And you can see this like on the wet maps. I think of the one on the Today Show where they show the map of the jet stream. It's this jet stream that's pushing down over the mid part of the U.S. And it's down lower than that actually right now. This is just an illustration. But it's that, that creates the strong winds and also the incredibly cold air that's happening. Okay, so the polar vortex is really simply just a low pressure system that is happening because of this temperature difference. Now, I wanted to talk a little bit about snow because one of the things that people don't realize is that snow doesn't always have to come in flake form, okay? There's a really good uh, Smithsonian article about the shapes of snowflakes, but I was going to show you this um, website from the Caltech page that has a nice guide to it that shows you some of the different forms of snowflakes. They're actually classified morphologically or morphology. Morphology means shape, so they're classified by shape. So let's look okay, at that. Okay, this is a Caltech website, and it has a nice diagram of some of the different overall shapes of snowflakes. And see, they're not all flakes. Some of them are needle-like structures, some of them are plates, some of them are shards, and really what it boils down to is what is the temperature condition under which these things form. So snowflakes can come in everything as simple prisms, the hexagonal shapes that you see here, to what we think of as the snowflake. These are called stellar plates. So these are at temperatures from say 28 just below freezing to 5 degrees freezing. So the, the needles tend to form at the higher temperatures. Then you get into stellar plates. Then you get into sectored plates. So see, you can see the difference there between those two shapes. And then you get into what are called the dendrites. And this is what people more commonly think of as snowflakes. So these are the most well-known um, flakes. And they're usually pretty large, and they're easy to see the structure with the naked eye. Then you get more rare, the fern-like shapes, which are more, uh, more difficult to form, but they are also the largest. So um, the snow we, that we recently just had had these huge flakes in it. But then you also get things like columns and needles capped columns and these are all having to do with how the um, snow actually forms on its little nucleation plate split plates and stars so you can see that split plate there where it actually has a three-dimensional structure 
triangular ones, which are a little more, much more rare, and then even 12-sided snowflakes, okay? 12-sided uh, snowflakes, it happens when you have crystals that don't quite split, and they do what's called twinning, so it's like uh, conjoined twin snowflakes. And then you have bullet rosettes that are, that are pretty rare because they end up breaking up, and then dendrites, radiating dendrites, Rhymed crystal, so that's where you have a crystal that forms, but then it forms what's called rhyme on it, which is water drops that um, fall, or that collect on it and, f and freeze on the outside, and they can actually clump together and make little tiny snowballs that are called grapple. And then you have some irregular, irregular forms too. So these all have to do with the temperatures and conditions under which snow the snowflakes actually form. So not all snowflakes are what you think they are. They come in a variety of different shapes depending on the temperature, the humidity, and the conditions under which it forms. But I'm gonna link both this page and the Smithsonian article about how you can classify snowflakes into these, uh, what is that, 35 shapes? 35 shapes there? Okay, so that's just a little bit about snowflakes and how they form. So I figured since we'd recently had a, a pretty decent snowfall, although it did melt off right away, uh, I thought it would be a neat topic to talk about snowflakes um, and how they form on the podcast as a scientific uh, exploration. So now let's move on and talk about farm life. I wanted to make clear that the polar vortex is not just as a result of the the oceans warming. Those things have all those phenomenon have always occurred. It's just that the effect of them is becoming enhanced, and there's climatological data to support that. So it's not that they happen because the oceans are heating. It's that the temperature gradient is getting more severe as time passes and that's causing an enhanced effect to the storm. So I wanted to make, I didn't make that clear in that segment and I wanted to point that out because I don't want to spread misinformation. <laughs> that, that would defeat the purpose of me being a science teacher. But anyway, I just wanted to point that out. Okay, so um, as I mentioned about a week ago on Saturday, this past Saturday, it was 51 degrees and beautiful, and we went out riding horses, and it was a gorgeous, glorious day, and so was Sunday, and then the polar vortex came. Now, we have not been nearly as cold as a lot of my friends. Those wind chills that you guys are getting in the upper plains, those are so deadly and dangerous. In fact, I saw just an article a while ago about a student at the University of Iowa who died from exposure. Um, that's just terrible and I my heart goes out to everyone that's up there having to endure that and to all the animals and people who can't find appropriate shelter during that time it just it breaks my heart to think about that those conditions and there's nothing you can do really when you have that kind of weather you just have to do your best but it's almost impossible for our car heaters or our home heaters to keep up with that kind of condition um we had the week a week ago Saturday though we had snow it was um it started out as rain and we had cold air dip down over us and I had gone to check on Flame's leg because it was swollen Eleanor had told me and so I had driven I'd gotten up early because I was going to try to beat the snow I'd gotten up early and I drove over to the barn and right as I pulled in it started snowing with the same density as rainfall. And it was huge, big, what my cousin Dean said, our, my Uncle Archie used to call fried egg flakes because <laughs> they were big, round, white. It was beautiful, beautiful. Hard to drive in because you couldn't see. It was blowing so hard. Uh, but luckily, the temperatures hovered right above freezing, so the roads did not freeze. It came down so fast. We got about six inches here, and it made for a beautiful pictures, and then it started immediately melting off because we never really got below freezing until very much later. So a lot of it froze off, or uh, thaw, uh, melted off, excuse me, uh, over the course of the next couple of days. Um, you know, what that brings to mind is we're getting toward the end of winter, and my hay's getting low. I think I have timed it out where I'm going to have enough hay to get me at least to the first part of March, which is what I, my goal was. So, and, and I've been able to keep plenty of hay in front of my animals. They haven't 
ever had to go without. Sometimes they complain, like yesterday, the cattle, they hear me outside and they come up to the fence and start mooing and bawling and carrying on. And I'm thinking, oh, they're out of hay. I went out. They still had hay. They just wanted some more. <laughs> So I put out plenty of hay for them and plenty of hay for the horses, and um, they were happy, I hope. Uh, the chickens have all been moved into the big coop. I finally did all of the final repairs on it and it moved all the chickens into the big coop, and they have enjoyed that because uh, the first couple of days when it was really super cold, I left them shut up in there for a couple of days, so they kind of get used to this was home now. And now what I do is I let them out in the afternoons for a few hours. Uh, like I'll go, when I'm done recording this, I'll go out. It'll be about 1 o'clock and I'll go out and let them out for until 4.30 or 5 o'clock and then put them up. Uh, so that's been good. Uh, they're laying really well. I actually need to gather eggs and get them out of there so I can start um, selling them again. Uh, Barn Kitty is doing a little bit better in her adjustment. She is coming out and around the other animals more. She still is having issues with my black and white cat, and I don't know what that's all about, but we're gradually, gradually overcoming those, I hope. Um, we did get to ride on Saturday and Sunday of last week, which was just joyful. I was so excited. On Saturday, we went out for a long trail ride. It's kind of our annual tradition to take the, the horses all down to what's called Peck Pond. Uh, Miss Marianne's last name, maiden name, is a Peck. And so they rode down, we rode down to Peck Pond. I rode Gusty and I was the sweep, which meant I was in the back making sure nobody had any trouble. We had, I think, 10 or 12 riders that day it was great um lots of lots of wonderful stuff to see because cheney rode poppy the little mare we went and got for christmas rode her out and poppy doesn't like water but cheney overcame it all and and um did really good with her and then on sunday we went back and some of them went out they were going to go out for a what I call a hoop and holler and jump and run trail ride, and I wasn't wanting to do that. So I rode Flame on on Sunday, which was wonderful, and stayed in the barn with the people who wanted to stay at the barn and uh, rode, rode, which was wonderful. Um, I finally went back to the chiropractor for the first time in two years because I had gotten to where I could not turn my neck much. I was very stiff. I was having to really struggle to turn. It was making it difficult to back out of parking places and stuff. And I thought, this is ridiculous. You need to find a new chiropractor and go. And while I know that there's some controversy on the value of chiropractors for pain management and for flexibility, for me, it is essential for me to have a chiropractor. Um, because a few years ago, it's probably been about five years ago now I tripped over a goat and that's a long story that I'll tell someday but I twisted my pelvis because I was afraid I was going to hit my head so I twisted my torso really hard and I landed on my hip and I knocked my pelvis out of alignment and for a year and a half I was in excruciating pain didn't know why my leg would go numb. I would get le like your leg was about to cramp all the time. I, it, I couldn't hike. I couldn't ride without just the searing pain in my leg. And I finally, and the current, the chiropractor that I had had kind of semi-retired because of an injury. And the person that was working with him was like, nah, nah, wasn't really doing much. I would describe to them the pain and they'd be like, well, it's, you just need to strengthen your core, but don't hike and don't ride horses. And I'm like, Okay, how am I supposed to strengthen my core if I'm not doing anything? But anyway, so I finally went to a chiropractor who comes down and works on horses, and he immediately saw the problem and adjusted me. And I'm not going to lie, that adjustment was painful at first because it had been out of whack for so long, you know, but it was like magic. It's immediately my leg felt better. Immediately I could walk better, walk further. But you know, once you have something like that happen, things tend to want to kind of pull. So I was out, it turns out I was out in my pelvis, which was then sending referred pain up to my shoulders and my neck and everything else. So um, last Wednesday I went for the first time and he does everything with machine adjustments now. Ironically, it's the same machine that our vet uses on the horses. Um, but adjusted me with that and I was very, very sore 
the next day, but I have slept better in the last week in terms of pain. I have been able to walk very far with no twinginess, no sciatica issues, no neck issues. You can tell it's still a little bit out of whack, and so I went back yesterday, and of course then yesterday afternoon, I slipped and fell on a wet floor and landed right on the flat of, my, flat of my back, whacked the back of my head just a little bit. And that's the second time I've done that in a year on a wet floor. I've got to learn better than that. Um, this time I didn't hit very hard. Luckily I was able to kind of collapse into the fall and not be so stiff. But um, I'm not sore from that really today. I'm still mostly sore from the adjustment, but I'm not hurting. And so for pain management, it does work. And it's something that I need to do because I'm always carrying you know, carrying 50 pound sacks of feet on my shoulder or carrying heavy buckets of water or working with young horses that pull and drag or lifting stuff or just, you know, just the wear and tear that farm life, you know, visits upon my body. It's definitely worth the money for me. Um, the other thing that went on, and this is kind of an aside, um, not really here on the farm, but last Sunday as I was going over to ride, I noticed smoke. And I drove by, and there was a very, very old house, Miss Reed's house. It was a very, very old house. I remember going in that house when I was a little girl. Miss Reed's been dead for probably 30 years, and the house has stood vacant. And I had asked some of her great-grandkids if they were ever going to do anything with it, and they said, well, it's too far gone. Because, you know, if you don't live in a house, it starts falling apart. And they burned it. They did a control burn. The fire department came and burned it. And I drove by right as it was in full blow burning and you could see the flames coming out the windows and you could see inside the house with the flames going up the walls and that profoundly affected me and I don't really know why I guess to see that landmark go really really affected me more than I thought that it would um but so that's where we are here on the farm. I think mostly um, things are going, things are going well um, here. You know, we're just waiting for springtime. We're going to celebrate a little bit of in bulk this weekend by burning our Yule greens. And I've saved all the greens that I cut for the Christmas trees or for the Christmas wreath party and pile those up in the garden and start thinking about cleaning our garden up and what we're going to plant and I've got my list of trees that I want to order so making plans for the new year and the rebirth of spring um so that's kind of where we're at so hope that y'all are all doing good I hope I hope 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 that you're staying warm I, I just my heart just goes out to everybody in these areas affected by this incredible dangerous cold uh, anyway, so now we're going to come back and finish up with a few final thoughts. Okay, I wanted to finish um, with a, a couple of final thoughts about... It's sort of tangential to all the conversations that have been happening within the fiber community. And I want to come at it from the tangent of a post that I saw on the Healthy Knitter blog post. So I want to share with you this quote by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And it says, I refuse to accept the view that mankind is so tragically bound to the starless midnight of racism and war that the bright daybreak of peace and brotherhood can never become a reality. I believe that unarmed truth and unconditional love will have the final word. And I was reading... I was reading this blog post by The Healthy Knitter about starting on January 30th, which was the day that Mahatma Gandhi was assassinated, until April 4th, which was the day that Dr. Martin Luther King was assassinated. There is a group that is called A Season for Nonviolence that starts a 64-day observance of nonviolence and peace. And the season of nonviolence is a place where you can study about uh, the idea of nonviolent protest and nonviolent action and how you can l contribute your voice in a way that's positive, non-hurtful to others, but moves the conversation forward. Because what I have seen 
even though they may not be physically violent, the reaction to a lot of the conversations that go that are going on are violent in nature, whether it's responses of violent shutting down or I'm not part of this, why are you accusing me or whatever. And people react that way when they're fearful. And they're fearful because, for a number of reasons, but I think the people that I've seen, I would like to believe that the people that I have seen act that way are fearful simply because they don't understand where the other person is coming from. And you can never completely put yourself in another person's shoes, but we can ponder on these these actions of to try to help one another and to try to understand one another and try to lift each other up and treat everybody with a sense of justice and ponder on how to do that without reacting without reacting by being proactive reacting is usually a violent in a way violent not physically violent necessarily but this this um, company or this company this group has on their website this beautiful thing called the peace mandala and the peace mandala is an interactive is an interactive um, mandala that has got all of these words. For example, it has self-sufficiency and responsibility and kindness and dialogue and education and healing and dreaming. And so the idea, there's 64 words, and the idea is you are to click on a word a day and meditate on that. So you start, you start with the first word is courage. For January 30th, the word was courage. And so it gives you a quotation, an affirmation, and a practice. The quotation for courage is, Courage is not the absence of fear, but rather the judgment that something else is more important than fear. And one of the conversations I had this morning was people being afraid to speak out. And I said, but we have to. Our, our temporary discomfort and fear is unimportant compared to the discomfort and fear that groups of people have been subjected to and the only way we're going to move through this is if we do speak out even when we're fearful or uncomfortable so that's by ambrose redmond and the affirmation is says today i have the courage to live in accordance with my values to speak from the heart to treat people with compassion and kindness to non-violently take a stand for what is just and the practice is light a candle, candle, not camel, candle to symbolize your commitment to accept the courage to practice 64 ways of living non-violently. And then today's affirmation or today's word is smiling. And that is something that even though I had not read this, I noticed that I have been trying harder to do. I have been trying harder to connect with people lately, although that is something that's very much outside my comfort zone. I'm very much, I want to walk with my head down, but I've been walking with my head up. I've been making eye contact. I've been smiling. I've been saying hello. That is how we break down those barriers to the other, is we see them as, 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 we, are, as we are. We are all one. And so uh, today's quotation is, let my soul smile through my heart and my heart smile through my eyes that I may scatter rich smiles in sad hearts. And that's by Paramahasana Yoganada. I may be saying that Yoganada, excuse me, I said that wrong. Affirmation, have you ever felt your heart warm and open, felt resistance soften? Felt any sense of isolation vanish simply by receiving someone's sincere smile. Today I scatter smiles freely knowing that this is the simplest form of peacemaking. And the practice is to share a sincere smile with everyone you meet knowing that your smile contributes to peace. So I'm going to share the link for uh, this peace mandala if you want to participate in that. I am also working through the workbook by Layla Saad on me and white supremacy. I am working through that workbook. Um, I am. It's going to take me longer than 28 days because I'm having to sit and chew on things for several days. And, you know, I don't want any kudos for doing these. These are the right things to do. And I don't want any kudos or rewards you know, my reward will be a world where people are kinder to each other. That's what I want. <laughs>
anyway, so I'm going to leave you with that thought. I'll link this piece mandala uh, where you can, if you want to meditate each day, I'm going to try to do this each day. And I hope that you are all doing good. And I hope that you were all meeting your crafting goals. And Willie has gone to sleep in his little warm coat here. So until I see y'all again, y'all be good to each other and y'all take care of each other and peace out, y'all. Bye.